Well, good evening to our viewers in Germany and hello to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. This week marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York and Washington and the downing of a passenger plane in rural Pennsylvania. We're joined today by two German journalists and book authors who worked tirelessly to piece together the events leading up to the September 11th, 2001 attacks. And since then, they have followed leads and developments from that fateful day. To mark the 10 year anniversary, Suad McKennett and Emma Tavison made a two part documentary titled 9 11 The Day the World Changed. This documentary analyzed the profound global impact of September 11th on politics and society. And they won the prestigious Deutsche Fernsehpreis for their work. Both of them are currently based in Washington, DC, but they're here in New York right now. And so I'd like to welcome both of you today. Thank Suat McKennett is a correspondent for the Washington Post's National Security Desk, and she's reported on terrorism for the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, as well as NPR. She's written four books, including her most recent memoir titled, I Was Told to Come Alone, My Journey Behind the Lines of Jihad. Suad, herzlich willkommen. Dankeschön. And Emma Tevison has been a television journalist since the early 1990s. He currently serves as the bureau chief of ZDF's studio in Washington, D.C., and he's been there since March of 2019. Elma is a well-regarded terrorism expert and the author of seven books, including four on terrorism and Al-Qaeda. Elma, thanks for, for joining us. Thanks, Steve. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So I'd like to begin by asking each of you to, to share with us where you were 20 years ago when you heard the news about the attacks and what the first thought might have been that, that went through your head. And I'd like to start with you, Suad. Um, you, of course, sprang into action, uh, delving into the backgrounds of the Hamburg cell. But do you remember where you were um, when you heard the news? Yeah, so actually I was uh, attending university class. I had just graduated from Henry Nunn Journalism School in um, April of the same year, 2001. And I will explain to you in a, in a second why this is important. The Henry Nunn School is based in Hamburg. So, but then I returned to Frankfurt to finish my university degree. And I was listening, I was attending a lecture of one of the professors when my phone began to ring my mobile and my family started sending me messages. Where are you? Come back home. You have to come now. It's important. And this is how I learned about, you know, the attacks uh, in New York first and then the Pentagon and what happened in Pennsylvania. Now I mentioned to you, I was, um, you know, uh, 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 I attended journalism school in Hamburg and it turned out that three of the four so-called 9-11 pilots used to live and study in Hamburg at the same time when I lived in Hamburg. And this is why, was another reason why I became so motivated to actually, as you, as you said, um, get into action. And I actually returned from Frankfurt to Hamburg. I got the permission from my university professor to um, jump in and cover the events, but I of course had to also finish my university degree. So it was, uh, yeah, I was a student, university student, and a full-fledged journalist back then. And, and, and it really sort of um, kicked off your investigative journalism career in, in many ways, um, a lot of the work that you were doing at that time. But what, so what was the first thought that you had when you heard, when you heard the news? Did, were you taken by surprise? Yeah, well, I was, um, the first thought we had as a family, because we were sitting around the TV um, and, we were thinking, oh good, oh my God, this is World War World War Three starting basically, and um, and then the, the next shock um, to us was when it turned out that those men who were behind it were um, Muslims, were people of Arab descent, and that three of those people lived and studied in Germany. In fact, were also recruited in Germany. So it became you know one shock after the other, and to me, being 
not only just being a journalist who had graduated from the journalism school, but also some a, a woman of Muslim Arab descent who lived in Germany and who grew up in Germany. Of course, you know, I was in deep shock and I was trying to understand what happened to these people. Why did they turn into mass murders? And um, so for me, this was also um, very, very challenging being who I am with my background to, to figure out what happened here and why is this happening? And so, yeah, it was quite uh, shocking. And in, in many senses, you know, these questions about what happened to these people and, and how did this happened to these people is uh, uh, one of the many threads that sort of carried through your professional career um, since then. But we'll we'll come back to that maybe in, in just a little bit. Um, Emma, what about you? Where where were you um, on 9-11 and, and uh, what was the first thought that went through your head? Yeah, I was in Berlin, actually in the edit suite. We were just editing a piece for investigative magazine uh, Frontal 21. Uh, and we were aiming for, you know, doing some investigative stuff on uh, Rudolf Scharping, who, you, who used to be the defense minister in Germany at that time. And maybe if we had aired that night, that could have been or could have had an impact. But we were sitting there in the edit suite. All of a sudden, the door opened. Somebody came in and said, what are you doing? I mean, do, don't you know what's going on? And then we switched on the TV. And we saw actually, as everyone else, what was happening in New York, Washington, Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I, I frankly say my, my initial thought was Al-Qaeda because um, in the years before, I had spent six years in Washington, 95 to 2001. I'd covered the return of the victims of the 98 bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, we actually, when we came back, when I came back to Germany in 2001, at the beginning of that year, uh, I did a story in May on Al-Qaeda in Germany, the connections between people in Germany contributing somehow to the Kenya and Tanzania bombings. I was in touch with um, Mohamedou Atslahi. Some of you might know him. He uh, mm -hmm. is famously featured a little, a little bit actually in this movie, The Mauritanian. Um, so I was in touch with him in the summer through email because he had seen our pieces on Al-Qaeda. And so when I saw that, I thought 93, 98, 2000, probably Al-Qaeda, and also that this would be a big war in the upcoming years. And so, you know, for, for you, having just spent, um, what was it, five, six years um, in Washington and covering the U.S., um, you know, you were very prescient in terms of thinking um, what the the roots of the attack might have been, but um, you know, you must have been just as surprised as everybody who was in the U.S. to see those images of a country that you had gotten to know a lot better from your reporting, not just from Washington, but you were out in the field as well. You are absolutely right, Steve, and it was a surprise that they were able to pull off an attack like this because. Um, I, we, we knew about the 98 bombings. We knew about the USS Co. We also knew about the 1995, 1994, 95 plots called Bojinka, you know, where, where actually Ramzi Yusuf and others were planning to kidnap 10 planes and crash them into targets. So the modus operandi was also there, at least for the people who somehow were connected to do investigative work in the intelligence community, as well as I would say in some of the congressional committees. And so it was a surprise that, that the US was not able to prevent it because you would have thought that they would have connected the dots. But of course, in hindsight, everyone is smarter and, and there were reasons why it didn't work. Part of that was of course, because the uh, security authorities, the intelligence services didn't actually work, uh, cooperate as much as they should have in, in, in before 9-11. I'm, I'm sure that both of you have sort of poured over the 9-11 Commission report. Um, it's, I have to admit, it's been a long time since I've picked it up, but I, I remember vividly um, sort of coming away with a sense of there being a, a lack of imagination, um, a lack of preparation and a lack of coordination um, on the part of security agencies 
in the U.S. Um, because, you know, certainly from what you just touched on, Emma, um, this is something that people could have or should have anticipated uh, as, a, as a possibility. Not necessarily, of course, the population, uh, but the people who, and there were people among the FBI agents, among the CIA agents, who were warning. And, and actually, you, you know about the famous meeting between FBI and CIA, uh, and, and one, it, it could have made a huge difference if the FBI had known early on that Khaled Almida and Nawaf Al-Hazmi were coming to the U.S., uh, from from a meeting that was under surveillance, apparently in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and then they came to the U.S. So if they had followed those guys around, if they hadn't lost them, if they had, you know, uh, exchanged the information, um, maybe 9/11, at least in part, could have been prevented. But of course, that's that's all all, all in hindsight, and and I know that there are people working there. People make mistakes, and and so uh, it happened. So coming back to, to each of you and, and each of your biographies, um, I, as an outsider, um, I think it's fair to say that, that each of your professional careers um, have been shaped in some way by 9-11. And so here we are you know, on, the, on the eve of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. I wonder if you can um, sort of tell us how you feel 9-11 has impacted each of your lives. And, and so let's let's maybe start with you again and, and then go to Emma. Yeah, I would also like to maybe um, comment on a few things that have been yeah. said or uh, touched upon um, by Elmar and you. Uh, you know, after having covered this for 20 years, um, I actually realized that the problem started much earlier. Um, uh, you know, how is it possible that uh, we talked about now some of the of the Saudis, uh, Alma mentioned them and their meeting in Kuala Lumpur. But how was it possible for years that hate preachers were able to preach in Europe, um, um, created um, their you know so-called mosques, um, and nobody cared about you know what they were preaching there? And I spoke later to some uh, members of Arab intelligence services who were telling me, "We told the Europeans for years you have an, you have a problem there. You have a problem with people who are preaching a, a version, an interpretation of Islam which has which is full of hatred, which is you know going yes against the leadership and rulers in the Middle East, but it will one day also turn against you." And some of the things I heard from the European friends were, uh, "Well, you're just against this because this is freedom of speech. Don't get involved." Uh, so that's number one. I think we have to also talk about when we talk about intelligence sharing um you know there was a lack also on that level um now i i think it's in particular very important because where are we today okay you asked me how did this shape my career yes you're absolutely right i would say and i try to explain this also in the book i dedicated a large part of my life trying to explain to a western audience why there are people out there who hate the West so much because it was the wife of a firefighter who died during 9-11 who asked me that question many years ago. And she said, if we had known why there are people out there who hate us so much, maybe we could have done something to prevent this from happening. So I tried for 20 years to also explain how did we get there? How was it possible that three men who came as students to Germany got recruited by people in Hamburg and then turned towards you know, uh, the Al-Qaeda ideology. So I tried for 20 years. Now, Steve, we just saw how Afghanistan has been handed over to the Taliban, the same group that actually enabled Al-Qaeda and, and some other groups to set up their training camps there, the same training camps in which those three 9-11 pilots from Germany, as well as others, <laughs> including the Saudis, were trained. And um, so... I have to say, if I look back today um, at the 20 years of coverage, one of the big issues I believe we have today and we had 20 years ago and we probably are going to have in future is that people don't want to listen. The way that European intelligence services 
didn't want to listen to some of what their Arab counterparts were telling them 20 years ago about those extremist point of views that were spreading all over Europe is the same way that maybe today, unfortunately, some politicians in, in the West don't want to listen to the voices who tell them, listen, you just handed over this country into the hands of the, let's say, more extreme forces within the Taliban. We don't know where this is, you know, what this is. This is encouraging actually other extremist groups. We see this online. And you're discouraging at the moment any kind of, let's say, secular movements in the region. But people don't want to hear it. And um, it's very sad because I wish that I could say today, after having covered this for 20 years, that's it. I'm going to be, you know, out of a job. But unfortunately, Elma and I, I think we will have to cover this for another 20 years. And yeah, that is, I would say, where I see things going today. Thank you. I mean, that's that's very sobering. Um, but you know, I think a very a very realistic way of of looking at at the issues. Um, Emma, what, what about for you? I mean, obviously, um, you were a, a terrorism expert before 9-11 um, and had been very interested in covering uh, terrorism, um, but 9-11 must have shaped your life as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how sort of your career uh, has evolved um, since then and what some of the issues are that you're covering and, and maybe pick up on some of the points that, that Sue had mentioned? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it started... On that day in the evening, uh, I was told to come to our headquarters in Mainz immediately. Uh, and I went to the airport. My wife came with a suitcase. The kids were standing there. They were, they were worried because they had seen the pictures and they thought, well, now uh, dad is going to go there to, to the U.S. I, I didn't. I stayed at the headquarters actually and started what Suat was just telling us that we tried to explain over 20 years now. What are the, um, the reasons for something like this to happen? And uh, so for the next 20 years, I was the terrorism analyst for ZDF, uh, not only uh, being there when there was an attack, be it in Madrid 2004 or London 2005 and Bataclan in Paris and the Reichsplatz in Berlin and everything else in between. So I was standing there, was using my information, my connections to actually uh, report on what was going on, trying to give some perspective, but at the same time also doing the long stuff, the documentaries, the articles, the books, as Sua did. And actually, we we joined forces. We together uh, went out. We explored. Uh, we talked to people uh, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and other places. And I think the lesson learned here is that it's very hard to make clear or actually that people understand that you cannot defeat terrorism. There is no way to defeat terrorism if you focus only on military, on intelligence, on exchanging information. It's good to do that uh, because it helps to prevent attacks. But in the end, you will never defeat terrorism unless you try to take away the fertile ground that is actually then the place where people get radicalized. And if you meet those people, you learn that, well, they think of themselves as, as kind of a vanguard force. They, they think of themselves as revolutionaries. They want to fight the injustices of the world. And that explains why very few people can actually, unfortunately, if they are determined enough, uh, and unfortunately also are willing to, to, to kill themselves in the process, uh, uh, wreaks so much havoc. And, and, and that's what makes me a little bit frustrated that 20 years in, uh, still we are not doing enough, way not enough to take away the fertile ground uh, because we see so many things happening in the world that actually will create more terrorism. As for example, did the Iraq war, as for example, did also the, um, the you know, that, that we also uh, tread on, on civil liberties or human rights in the process with torture and many other things. So we really have to think through what is a better way to fight terrorism and to prevent another 9-11 from happening in the future. 
So, so maybe one you know question to both of you is is do you have ideas about what that better way is? I mean, obviously engagement. Um, both of you have spent a lot of time and energy over the last twenty years talking to people both in and throughout the region as a whole, but also in the West, and trying to explain some of these these differences. Um, but to pick up that point, Emma, of there has to be a better way. Uh, to fight or to counter uh, terrorism and extremism, do you have any recommendations um, for how to do that? So do you want to start? Yeah, I wasn't sure who, is, who he was asking because he mentioned your name, but uh, I'll be happy to start. So I think there are, you know, this is, as Elma mentioned, I think we are talking here about, you could say, some kind of asymmetric war, which you cannot indeed I, I agree fully, um, win through mil military actions only. But, you know, as Elma mentioned, we have certain values in, or at least we say we have certain values in, 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 in the West, in our Western style democracies, uh, human rights, freedom of speech, and so on. And um, if we say to people, these are the universal fundamental values that we believe, believe in, then, of course, one of the big questions um, I have been always asked by um, young people who were on their way of getting radicalized, it's like, no, these rights are only for non-Muslims. Look at how many Muslims were taken to secret detention centers and tortured. And for example, a case that always pops up is uh, because it, there is a relation here to, to Germany, is the Khalid al-Masri case. I cannot tell you how many people who joined Al-Qaeda or ISIS later were mentioning to me, well, look at the Khalid al-Masri case. This German man who was of Lebanese descent, who was on his way to Macedonia and then kidnapped by the CIA, CIA taken to um, Afghanistan, where he disappeared for a few months, was tortured, and until somebody realized we have the wrong guy, and then he was dumped uh, somewhere in um, Albania. And as you know, and the man is still waiting for an explanation until today, what happened here? Why did this happen to me? And who knew about this, including the question, did some people within the German government knew about this and didn't do anything? So all of these, so we will be you know, people will actually measure our credibility by how are we using um, these values and these these rights? And is it really indeed what they believe? Um, just, you know, there's certain values and rights, rights for one group, but uh, not for, for the other. So we will have to deal with that. Are we ready to, to talk about um, what happened after 9-11 and during the so-called war on terror where people did disappear are we willing to talk about also i mean this happened during the bush era but you know there were many mistakes made also during other presidencies alma and i we went to um Vazir waziristan we spoke to people whose family members were killed during drone strikes um this happened during um uh, president obama so you know there are and, and those were innocent people for example there are a lot of um, questions that are no longer a lot of issues that may no longer be part of what we see on our in our news cycle. But trust me, Steve, those people back in Waziristan, as well as the people in Iraq, or um, you know, uh, people in the countries where things happened or where people disappeared or were killed, they care about this. So, and as long as we do not engage and talk about those mistakes that were made and open up the books and explain what happened here, we will always um, give, for example, recruiters a very good um, um, uh, ground to, to recruit there and to, to, to catch people. One thing that Alma said, if I may add to this, we had 20 years where we should have tried to win over hearts and minds. And I think that war, unfortunately, until today, that is not a war that we in the West won over. And one last point, and then I may I would like to hear also what Emma has to say is, you know, we often, I mean, I saw what happened to Iraq when we tried to add democracy, when we turned Iraq into a democracy. What happened was <laughs> you took out a Ba'athist regime, which was a dictatorship, we all know this, but it was a secular dictatorship. You had women who were part in the army, you know, who attended the army, you had women, you had working all over the place, you had um, people of different religious groups who were in powerful positions, Christians, 
um, uh, Sunni, Shia. I mean, this is just a fact because I spoke to these people. What happened in Iraq in 2003 with the debathification and the longer this, this, this war took was that it opened up the doors for people who lived for many years in Iran who were part of a very, let's say, extremist Shia <laughs> point of view. And, um, and you suddenly had Shia militias uh, entering Iraq, which led to a lot of extremism within the Sunni groups, especially former um, army members of police, members of the police forces who were thrown out of their jobs during the debathification. And, and so, you know, there were all these different mistakes made because people believed we have to implement democracy, a voting system into this country. And now we live in a big mess. So one maybe, you know, one point to think about is rather than going out there and saying we need to implement a voting system, why don't we talk first about values, you know, universal values like the equality of men and women, human rights and others, and, and start to engage with people on these grounds. And rather than saying it is, it's all about the voting system. And those were some of the points. And mm -hmm. maybe I have some more to add. Yeah, I mean, those were great points. Um, Emma, feel, feel free to dive in. Yeah, if I may, and I'd, I'd like to jump also on a, on a very uh, big level on something that a um, colleague of the Philadelphia Inquirer just wrote this week, and I think he's right. Um, if you look at 9-11, I think Al-Qaeda aimed to weaken us uh, politically, economically, and also our societies. They tried to weaken the democracy. Uh, and and I don't, I'm not saying that they planned for that the U.S. would then swarm out and come to Afghanistan. I think they underestimated that and Osama bin Laden was kind of surprised by that. But the, the overall aim was to weaken us. And look what we did. We went out with all the old tools and all the old concepts and all the old structures and did exactly what they wanted us to do. We went out in addition to Afghanistan, which I think was justified, we also went to Iraq. We used all those measures that I mentioned before and treaded on the human rights and civil rights of many people around the world, including American citizens within the United States and also German citizens in Germany. So we did exactly uh, what they were expecting us to do because we had done it in the decades before and what happened is we weakened ourselves. If you, if you look at what's going on around the world right now, the problem of terrorism has metastasized. We are, have been in a huge mess in Afghanistan. And I think it really took courage to end this. And I think it was a good decision to end this in the end, although it was way too messy and it could have been better planned and everything. But not only we created a big mess around the world, at the same time, we also created a mess within our societies because the moment it was okay to base a war on lies, those lies also were being used in the political fight within our countries to demonize people who thought differently, to actually also create hatred against people who look different, who have a different religion, who have a different ethnic background. And so I think it kind of permeated, it, it, it became pervasive, this kind of um, uh, angst, as we call it in Germany, the fear, and also the way we, we deal with each other. So in the end, it all contributed to the polarization of our societies and thereby creating also what now is considered to be the biggest threat in the United States, and I would argue also in Europe, is terrorism, extremism from within. And mm -hmm. there is a straight line between 9-11, where the attackers tried to fly a plane into the capital, and January 6, where insurgents actually stormed the capital and nearly brought democracy. We, we might try to forget that, but I think they, they came close to, to bring democracy down in the US. And so I, I'm very much with Michael Hayden, whom I talked to last week, the former head of CIA and NSA, who said, well, uh, 
this is very, very significant. I'm worried about my grandkids, he said, because I, I thought the US would be, there are many problems in the US, but we are getting better gradually. But this is something that makes me not being sure anymore about that. I'm not certain about this anymore. Democracy is in danger and that keeps him up at night. So, so I think we have to think more about that. Elmar, I'm, I'm happy that you brought up this, this notion of a straight line between 9-11 and January 6th, because um, I had not um, sort of quite been able to articulate that yet for myself. Um, I was listening to the radio this morning though, um, and heard an interview with somebody who um, actually served in the US military in Afghanistan as a, as a medic. And he said that on January 6th, he felt exactly the same way that he had felt on 9-11 and just a tremendous concern um, about the, the future of democracy and that democracy is in danger. Um, but, you know, one other thing that I, I'd like to, to draw out, I mean, Elmo, you were talking a little bit about um, polarization um, in our societies. Uh, both you and Suad have, have brought up, um, you know, a number of different cleavages that exist, um, both in the West, but also in the region. And um, one of the things that I've been trying to wrap my head around as I've been thinking about uh, the recent developments in Afghanistan and the resurgence of the Taliban um, has been the urban-rural divide. And I've never really thought of it as it relates to a place like Afghanistan. I've thought of it much more in terms of what we see both here in the US, but also in Germany unfolding. How much of a degree, how, to what degree do, do each of you sort of look more closely at that urban rural divide in a place like Afghanistan. I mean, you've both traveled there extensively. Um, you've gotten out of the major urban areas and I'd be interested to hear um, what what your thoughts about that are. I don't know who wants to go first. I leave it up to up to the two of you. Suad, yeah, Suad you're so, muted. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think uh, just a few points. I think my colleague and I, Elma and I, as, as much as we agree on um, on many things, but we do disagree also in the whole situation in Afghanistan. And while I agree something had to change, and I also, I think we all understand that um, the US military wouldn't be, have been able to stay there forever. I think one of the biggest um, problems and uh, greatest threats that we're going to have to face in future is because of how, um, the, you know, how fast the military went out. And um, I believe if people, you know, people who know Afghanistan and who know also the connections the Taliban have um, cross border into Pakistan, or for example, um, you know, the tribal connections um, um, of, of uh, certain Taliban leaders into um, uh, the rural areas um, of Afghanistan, but also <coughs> Pakistan. Oh, there's some, okay. Um, they, they, they could, you know, you, it is, for me, it is a surprise that people are surprised about how fast and how, how you know, how fast the Taliban were able to, um, to, to take over because if you understand a little bit the um, the the connections the tribal connections uh, that um, um, that this group has also um, across border um, I think it is clear that there are still a lot of you know deep rooted affiliations and 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 connections there but you said something one very important point steve here we discussed the whole time about the u.s military going in going out and was it right was it wrong i think what i missed in this conversation we have is also what has happened the past 20 years with those afghan governments what why were we i mean we are all seeing now it didn't work we should and there have been indications long time ago that it wasn't working that there was a lot of corruption going on that what we has we were seeing in kabul is not what was going on outside of kabul in 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 other areas where you still had um you know the tribes uh, having their own policies and rules out there and so i think we we will have to do a lot of uh, you know research here about 
what kind of money did go into Afghanistan? Where did this money go? What kind of arms have been now handed over into the into the you know arms of the Taliban and their affiliated groups? And um, so I think we will have to we will have to really understand a little bit why wasn't this information going out um, sooner and and much louder, or why did the U.S. president not listen to some of his advisors who told him that this this idea of just getting out one day or the other was not a good idea. If, if I may address that question, of course, I think uh, we, we went to Afghanistan and Pakistan in 2011. We talked to people there, as Suat pointed out. For example, in Pakistan, in Peshawar, we were at a refugee camp, which is still there. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people live in that area who have been refugees from Afghanistan. We talked to them and they told us they hated the Americans because they gave America the fault for, uh, for what happened to them, that they had to leave their country because of a war. We talked to Afghans when we were in Afghanistan and they told us, we hate the foreigners. They shouldn't be here. They make everything bad and we have all that. And, and I'm not saying that this is true, but they, th that was their perception. And I think that should have made us think what we made wrong because we were not able to really connect with the local communities and try to help them to create a better future for themselves. So the bridge building and the schools and all that, we tried, but we failed because whenever we went out and I was there at Jalalabad, FOB, Fenty, I was in Kunduz and in other places, we went out with all the heavy gear, uh, trying to protect ourselves and as much as possible, not talk to the local communities. That's different in other places, but it was true in Afghanistan. And so I think, and Steve, I think you hit the point. Um, Barack Obama once said that war, terror, and migration are side effects of globalization, which is true. Uh, not because globalization in itself is bad, but we do it in a wrong way. Globalization is focused on the benefit of a few and not focused enough on the benefit of, of as many people as possible. It's not focused around people. I'll give you an example. If we send the ships of the European Union, the fishing ships, the fleet down to the west coast of Africa, and take away all the fish because we like to eat those in Germany and other places in Europe. Then the fishermen in those areas, they don't have a future for their families. So what do they do? They either um, will try to get money some other place. Some of them resort to criminal activities. And if somebody comes around and tells them, well, you can make some money and you can work for a good cause for more justice, you can join us and this is a terrorist group, then people might join terrorist groups. That's what happened on the east side of Africa, in Somalia, for example, and other places. And if they don't wanna do that, then the only other option they have to make their way to a place where they have a better future or a chance for the better future. And that's how we create the migration, we create the terror, and we create the wars. And I think you asked about this, Steve, before. I think the only way to make it better is to come up with new ideas how we actually not go in and try to create a democracy or something, but help people specifically in rural areas, and the same applies to the US, Germany, and other places, to benefit from progress, from globalization as well. I think that's the key. And that's a huge challenge, right? Um, a, to come up with those ideas, but also to really get that local local engagement um, and really then address the steps that are taken to the goals that the local communities um, map out together, um, right? I mean, I think that in each of these different narratives, having that local involvement is um, is incredibly important, and that's one of the things that's been that's been missing. So as we sort of stick with with Afghanistan for just a, a couple more minutes, I have maybe one or two more questions and then want to come back to sort of 9-11 and the legacy of 9-11. But um, were, were either of you 
surprised um, by the rapid resurgence of the Taliban in Afghanistan, or was this, you're both shaking your heads, um, that you expected that it would be this, this quick? Suad, maybe, maybe you first and, and then Omar. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I did. I mean, I hate to say it, but, uh, you know, Steve, there are some interesting questions that we all have to, I hope we will one day get the answers. I mean, we, there were negotiations going on between some factions of the Taliban. I mean, Mullah Barada was the, 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 the leader, um, the leading figure there in Qatar for a long time, um, first with the Trump administration and then also um, with um, members of the Biden administration. And to me, so it didn't come as a surprise. I, I think Elma also shaked his head and said it didn't come as a surprise to him. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, there must have been some kind of communications going on between some members of the Taliban in Afghanistan and Mullah Barada while he was sitting in Doha. <laughs> And I'm wondering, did nobody pick up on this? Was it, you know, I think they, there are still a lot of many unanswered questions about who could have known when that this was that this was happening. But um, no, I must I must tell you, I think um, I'm I'm surprised that so many people are surprised. I wasn't. Um, I just it worries me about as a woman as a as a, as a muslim woman now um it, it does worry me of course uh, I, i'm worried about what this means for women in in the country and um if you remember there were a few politicians back in 2001 and 2003 2002 and so on who um, argued we have to um we have to free the afghan women now, I don't think many people talk about the Afghan women uh, during this period of time, but it also worries me about what this will, what impact this is going to have on um, Muslim societies um, outside of Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in the Middle East, uh, but also in, in Europe. Um, uh, because uh, as we see today already in some of those jihadist forums, they, you know, Al-Qaeda and their affiliates are celebrating it and uh, see this as an encouragement to spread the word. Um, so we will have to deal with a lot of the aftermath also of uh, what is going on in Afghanistan at the moment. And maybe as a footnote to that, and, and Emma, you can, um, you can respond to this too. You know, it's, it seems that you know, now with, with the withdrawal, with the Taliban in power, um, with I think you know, fraught relations between the West and the neighboring countries around uh, Afghanistan, it will be very difficult for the U.S. and Europe to, to monitor um, developments there, to monitor extremism, um, and to target extremists. And so I think one of the other concerns is uh, what can be done to, to prevent that resurgence um, in the country? You're, you're absolutely right. But the thing is, you know, we tried 20 years and we had better people than Mullah Barada in power, uh, Af, uh, uh, Ghani, Ashraf Ghani, and before that, of course, Hamid Karzai, but we failed to make sure that they, though they were really working for the good of their own people because we poured billions, and or I would say a trillion dollar or $2 trillion in Afghanistan, and we didn't make sure that it ended up with the right people. We saw that in 2011 when we were there, for example, we were driving on the street, I think it was between Kabul and Jalalabad, and somewhere there was a huge parking lot with all the new cars for the security services, you know, those pickup trucks. And we asked, why are they sitting here? Why are they not being used? And they told us, well, somebody is selling them off or handing them off to the Taliban. And so I, I don't know if that's true. We didn't figure that out. But if you can read, you can read the report of the it, uh, Inspector General for Afghanistan, who put it in his reports, and he testified in Congress publicly. And in Germany, the Bundeswehr was also reporting. And if you read through what they reported, you see the exact same thing, the corruption going on everywhere, that uh, the ghost soldier thing. And then also, I should mention the United Nations going in there with a hell lot of money. They bought all the best talent from local authorities and also the, the national authorities for their purposes. They paid them much more than anyone else. And so they created this 
um, basically an administration of Afghanistan that didn't have the best talent because they were working for somebody else. This all came together. And I would say I wasn't surprised about what happened because the minute that Trump struck the deal with Mullah Barada and the others, and this, this picture of Mike Pompeo with Mullah Barada, I mean, that sent a signal. And I didn't know about the deals that were being made after that between the Taliban and the local authorities in the different cities and so on. I didn't know about this. Now I know about it. But it explains why it all crumbled. And I wonder why nobody, maybe somebody has seen it, but if, if yes, then it was a huge failure. I mean, the cities of Kunduz and mazar -e sharif and Herat, the local authorities made their own deals with the Taliban because they got the signal from the Trump administration, we're out. We're out in May 2021. So everybody made their own deal, which included handing over the power without the Afghan army fighting it. And they told the local authorities in Kunduz told the Afghan army to go home. So it shouldn't have been a surprise for someone mm -hmm. who actually had boots on the ground and intelligence, hopefully somewhere in Afghanistan. So in the end, I think given all the problems, I don't think it was a huge surprise. Again, I think it was the right decision. It could have been handled much better. Um, but if you fail for 20 years to think that you can fix it all of a sudden, that would have required not only a huge surge of military, but also, again, a system that makes sure that all the money that you pour in ends up with the people and not with some people in power. So maybe a, a follow up to that, um, because that's sort of, you know, looking at, at our involvement and engagement over the last 20 years and, and what went wrong. Um, but right now, as we're all watching the, the images coming out of Afghanistan, it's clear that there's a serious humanitarian crisis um, unfolding there and that providing aid is is sort of something that's that's a moral responsibility, I think, for the United States for Europe, um, but it's also important in terms of trying to provide some regional stability. And yet the big question is, how does one go about um, providing that humanitarian aid? Um, do, do either of you have any ideas or suggestions, um, maybe some of those new ideas that we need to start coming up with? Emma, you, you smiled the yeah. biggest, so let me give um, that to you. Yeah, I think, and, and it's hard to accept, but the question is, if we want that, if we want a stable Afghanistan, there is no other way than in some way find a, uh, how will you say that? Not in a way cooperate or be friends with the Taliban, but make it, uh, make it work for the people. And either you do it yourself by directly talking to the Taliban without establishing an official mission or something, or you do it through proxies through the United Nations, which I think would be a good idea to do that. But we need to help the people in Afghanistan. And if you want to have a stable situation, we all know that the Taliban are under huge pressure. They have to deliver for their people and if they don't, then this will fall into civil war, again, uh, a huge civil war. It will create hundreds of thousands of refugees that not only go to Pakistan and might destabilize Pakistan, but also to, to other countries surrounding Afghanistan, but also come to us, to Europe. So we have a big interest. And I think it is, it is worthwhile to say, uh, well, we have to define our interests here and then based on that act, which would include talking to the Taliban and find solutions. And Pakistan um, and, and others surrounding Afghanistan have a huge interest there too. They're not interested in getting terrorism exported from Afghanistan into their own countries. China, for example, if the Uyghur, uh, there is a small Uyghur terrorist groups, not the majority of the Uyghurs, but there are, is a terrorist group if they get huge support by the Taliban, then that creates a huge problem for China. So we'll have to define our interests, sit down together 
everyone should be participating at that table and then, then see what we can do to prevent worse things from happening. Thank you. Uh, Sua, do you have anything to add? And, and maybe one sort of follow-up question that's related to that is, given Elmar's comment about needing to talk with the Taliban, um, does the West have any leverage? I think the West has put themselves in a very, in an impossible, um, impossibly, impossibly bad position here um, for various reasons. I still, I mean, I believe, I, I agree with Elmar, things had to change in Afghanistan, but I kindly disagree here that I think um, because people should have known what happened when um, President Trump made the deal or Pompeo made the deal with Mullah Barada and that the Taliban were reaching out to local warlords and so on. You know, the Biden administration could have changed the way this whole situation occurred, okay? We could have started with, they could have said, okay, we start with a withdrawal of so and so many soldiers, but we first want to see that you, the Taliban, are going to sit down with this government, whether it's corrupt or not, or with other groups within Afghanistan, and you find a solution and first agree on how you find together a way to move this country forward, and what can we do together to change the corruption and so on. Now, the other thing is a mistake that, um, unfortunately, the U.S. made in Iraq and also in Afghanistan is look at the people they listen to, look at the people they, they, they brought in to, 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 to play important roles. In Iraq, it was Ahmed Shalabi and a few other people, people who were educated in the US. It's the same thing for Afghanistan. Um, uh, Hamid Karzai is a US citizen, um, uh, Mr. Ghani is a US citizen, um, and um, uh, many people who worked with uh, the last, uh, in the last um, government in Afghanistan happen to be US passport holders as well. And just, you know, the, the way of thinking that just because we're putting people in there who, who studied in Harvard or the universities that, that are, you know, Western universities, doesn't mean that they will be able to engage with the rest of the population and will be able to implement uh, the things for the past 20 years that could have helped to develop a better uh, engagement with the society. Um, you know, most of these people didn't even believe Kabul themselves. So just to tell you, it's, uh, um, and, and this was known for years, but, so I think at the moment, where are we at the moment? The Taliban took over. So you gave the US and, and the West gave them the biggest leverage they have at the moment because they took over. Um, so they are the ones who are um, pretty much in a, in a position that, uh, that says, okay, you have the choice here. As Elma said, either you guys are gonna help us or what you might see in uh, the coming uh, weeks is a, a wave of refugees going via Turkey and other places uh, towards Europe. And we all know that Europe um, had already a huge problem with um, you know, you know, populist movements who have used what we saw um, a few years ago when um, these thousands of Syrians came to Europe as, a, as, a, as another breeding ground for their recruiting, right? So it's, it's uh, so I think we, we um, Western governments won't have any other choice but to find a way to help the country, the people in the country. Now, how are you going to do this? Because how will the Taliban allow the United Nations or the Red Cross uh, to go and uh, be the ones who organize all of this help? I'm not so sure about it um, because to them, it's also another leverage here. If they are the ones who are, who are going to be able to provide for the population, they will also... Um, you know, it will help them to stabilize their own um, leadership role within the country. So it's it's a very, very tricky, uh, tricky situation at the moment. And given that I believe European countries are very worried about um, an, a possible new quotation mark wave of refugees, I, I think they will probably try to find some kind of engagement with, with Taliban circles. But let me just add one last thing, please, Steve. The reason why I'm saying I believe if, if the withdrawn of, uh, out of Afghanistan would have been done in a different way is, you know, even within the Taliban, you have different factions. You have 
some people who want, who believe it is important to be a bit more open-minded to engage also women more in the decision making and so on that's a very small faction but it was a faction who is you know around Mullah Barada but Mullah Barada is not the person who is now in the leading position in this new government it is somebody who's more con considered to be a hardliner so I think if if the withdrawn out of Afghanistan would have happened in a different way in a much let's say slower way where, where the west would have said okay let's see how you engage with the rest of the population and the more we see that you're willing to also um change and and be open-minded towards the rest of the population you know we we, we withdraw um in in parts one month after month but now in fact actually the more extreme version of the taliban is in 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 the driver's seat in afghanistan and this is i think we we missed also a big opportunity there Sorry, I was just going to say um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and maybe one um, follow up question because one of our viewers posed this question: um, Is do do either of you think that the Afghan government funds um, that are being held in the United States should be released to the Taliban? I, I think under conditions, it's it's not. I think the discussion should not be whose lever is longer to coerce the other into something. Number one point should be define the interests and see where the interests overlap. And I think we have an interest as the Taliban have an interest to at least have help for people in Afghanistan, even though we have to accept that that might help the Taliban government. And then we can see if we can attach some strings to it. So it shouldn't be released the money either from the US or from the IMF. It's, I mean, nearly half a billion dollars that is sitting there that the IMF was supposed to send out in European Union as huge funds that were supposed to go out as well. So uh, we have to, unfortunately, sometimes we have to talk with the devil. And in this case we have, and then see what we can do. Um, even though I agree with the difficulties that Suad mentioned, um, but again, th the decision had been made in 2020. We were down to 2,500 soldiers. That was not even a force that could have been a match um, to, to hold if the Afghan army was folding. I think the decision, it, it was, it's, it's uh, how would you say it's, it's uh, in Germany, we say it's forgotten the milk, you know, it's the milk is gone. Old milk. Um, and, and I think we have to, we have to find a way to make it work and put a lot of pressure on, uh, on, on the Taliban through the other countries surrounding it. I'm not sure whether the Iranians, for example, will accept that Herat will be in the hands of the Taliban in the near future. So we, we have to wrap up. Um, this has been an, an incredible hour, um, very insightful, very thoughtful from both of you. But before I let each of you go, um, you're, you're both in New York. Undoubtedly, you're here to report um, on um, the ceremonies tomorrow and, and you'll be out and about in the city. Um, maybe just sort of a quick comment from each of you about what you'll be looking for as you as you think about um, your reporting from New York over the next 24 to 48 hours. Emma, why don't you go first this time and we'll give Suad the last word. Sure. Um, I think I'm looking for, um, number one, the, the, the feeling that this is really important to remember that but not only to remember the victims and what happened on 9-11, but also start thinking about what we could have and should have done differently afterwards. And I really think this is the important thing here, the, the commemorations here, as opposed to, for example, have all those documentaries, and I include ZDF as well, which show the horror of 9-11, including people jumping out of the windows over and over and over again. I think this is a violation of human dignity if we do that. I think we should commemorate in a way it is commemorated here by people coming together 
think about what was lost and also start thinking about what we should learn from it. Thank you, Elma. Suad. I'm, um, I'm surely thinking of the, of the, yeah, of the victims, as, as Elma mentioned as well, and uh, the lessons learned from um, for all of us. But I'm also, I must tell you, I'm still deeply touched and um, also shocked by the fact how many um, former policemen or firefighters are still suffering from uh, health issues and, and they're still trying to get some kind of support and, and help here. And it's, um, you know, if, if, and I hope that maybe now um, the events tomorrow, I know there's going to be a lot of politicians talking as well about it. I hope they will also hear those uh, those voices and 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 understand there are still people in the U.S. who are you know who are trying who are waiting for for for, for help and support. Um, but I will also be thinking about all the wars I had to cover, whether it was you know Afghanistan or Iraq, um, and all of the changes this the day brought to the rest of the world and what else we will have to face in future. So yeah, it's a, it's a very emotional day for me too. And I mean, as you've both said, um, you know, it's, it's not over. Um, we will be dealing with, with many of the issues coming out of 9-11 for, for many years to come. And, you know, I, I, although um, your documentary 10 days ago was named the, the day that changed the world or that the world changed, and there certainly is that perception um, by many people. I do want to come back to a point that you made earlier, Suad, that many of the, the trends and, and undercurrents um, were there well before 9-11. Um, and so it wasn't so much that that day changed the world as much as it's the day that the awareness changed in a, in a, very, significant, in a very significant way. Well, I want to thank both of you um, for your extensive reporting and extensive coverage, and coverage on um, all of the issues that we've talked about and, and more. Um, but I, I really want to thank both of you for making the time to, to have this incredibly timely and, and important conversation with us today. I, I truly appreciate it. Um, I wish you both well uh, and hope that you, you stay healthy um, in, the, in the days, weeks, and months ahead. You also. Thanks, Steve. Stay, thanks to everyone. Stay healthy. Thanks. Thanks, Elmar. Take care.